Hello and welcome to the Lafayette Club's next talk in our online lecture series. Today I will be talking to Sir John Layton, Director General of the Scottish National Galleries. He has also previously held the position of Director of the Van Gogh Museum and was awarded a knighthood in 2012. Thank you for joining us here today. Thank you, thank you for asking me. Uh, I'll dive straight into the questions and the first thing I'd like to ask you is that you currently hold the position of Director of the National Galleries. Uh, how has your career so far led you to this point? <laughs> well, it wasn't something I planned. Uh, I, uh, as a student, I took a degree in fine art from Edinburgh, which was split then between practical work at the art college and academic work at the university. And uh, I suppose my original ambition was to follow the, f the fine art side, the practical side, but um, it kind of became clear that I wasn't going to be the next Picasso. Uh, I was back in, um, uh, after uh, graduating from Edinburgh, and then uh, I did a postgraduate at the, the Courtauld Institute in London. And I was back in Edinburgh doing a little bit of part-time teaching at the university, at the art college and so on and so forth, when um, a friend of mine sent me a, a an advertisement from a newspaper. They were looking for uh, an assistant keeper at the National Gallery in London. Uh, I sent in an application. I found myself down in London at a civil service uh, interview because the National Gallery then fell under the, the civil service. Really bizarre uh, experience. And um, uh, I was appointed as an assistant keeper. I thought I was going to be assistant to a keeper, but in fact, uh, uh, the, the job was effectively curator of 19th century uh, paintings. I had no museum training, no background, no real knowledge. Uh, it took me about two weeks before I realized that the shutters on the room could open behind me on Trafalgar Square, so I was sitting in the dark. Uh, nobody was giving me any instructions of what to do. Um, but um, uh, gradually I got into it and over the years organized some uh, exhibitions, did some publications um, and I stayed at the National Gallery for let's see about 11 years as uh, looking after the, the, the fantastic 19th century collection there uh, and then an opportunity came up at um, uh, in Amsterdam. You, you mentioned in the American style the Van Gogh Museum or Van Gogh Museum or as the Dutch say the Fogh Museum uh, and again, I was jumping in at the, the deep end, re really, because uh, from being a, a curator, which is essentially being a, a manager of objects or looking after objects, if you like, uh, it's shifted to being a, a, a director, looking after people, buildings, everything, the, the end responsibility, if you like, with very little experience of any of that, and then doing it in a foreign language because I said to the, the colleagues that from day one I would work in Dutch and I'd been on some crash courses to, to learn Dutch. So that was a, a, a mad experience which I'm not sure that I would recommend. So about a decade at the um, uh, uh, at that museum and then another opportunity came up to um, uh, uh, take on the role of Director General here at um, the National Gallery of Scotland which at last was a bit easier uh, because I, I think I had a bit of a sense of what I was doing by then. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a great role with uh, responsibility for some of the uh, best uh, collections of fine art anywhere in the world and a great team of people. Uh, so the coronavirus pandemic has obviously had a big impact on museums, but what has been the most challenging part of the pandemic for the Scottish National Galleries? Well, it's been, it's been challenging for everybody, hasn't it? Every individual, every organisation, uh, every company, it's been, um, uh, we've run out of words, haven't we? I mean, how often have you heard unprecedented in the last uh, few months? Uh, I, I think there's been so many different uh, challenges and so much of this has been uh, new, but I think I would uh, initially say closing down the, the, the galleries really very quickly was uh, in itself uh, something of a challenge. So in a matter of hours, really, the instruction came through to, uh, to close and we had to switch from being a physical entity to being a virtual one. Uh, so moving uh, hundreds of uh, colleagues from working in, uh, on site to working from their home environments and getting that all up and running while at the same time maintaining 
business continuity, if you like, the security of the, the collections, the maintenance that has to go on, all the various things that keep the buildings ticking over, even if uh, they're not open to the public. So that was um, something of a challenge. Then that period through lockdown where um, uh, such a bizarre time, really, uh, of suspended animation. And for us, we had maybe about half of our staff on furlough leave to be able to cover the costs. Uh, if you can imagine, there's a whole lot of uh, uh, activities that we do that just couldn't be done anymore. Shops that were no longer open, cafes that were no longer open, et cetera, et cetera. So a whole lot of people had to go on uh, furlough. And then managing this strange um, binary feel within the organization that there are some people working harder than ever, uh, doing loads of stuff, putting all our stuff online, we're developing digital programs, uh, keeping uh, the funding going, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then another bunch of staff who were uh, on leave, un un unable to work, and uh, that managing that process. But then finally, um, I think the biggest challenge, <laughs> weirdly enough, has been reopening. And uh, if you had the impression, well, it's just a matter of undoing the closure, it was just turn the keys and open it up. It's been huge. I mean, the, the amount of preparation uh, that has to go into it, completely different ways of working, completely different ways of dealing with the public, all the preparations, all the cleaning regimes, all the PPE, all the risk assessments, all the management with extra staff of far fewer visitors and the preparations that have gone into that, that has been hugely challenged, uh, challenging. And so uh, now we have two of our uh, sites open and we're opening the um, uh the modern two gallery uh the week after next and the portrait gallery in early november but it's taken months and months of preparation to get that far so you mentioned that obviously there's far fewer visitors coming at the moment so what do you think will be the long-term impact of this on galleries do you think there will be a move to more digital collections in the future mm. Well, there's, there's lots of different schools of thought on all of this and there's lots of the debates go on uh, locally, nationally, internationally about, about this and you've had this, the, the, the same conversations in, in, in many ways. Uh, there are some people who say uh, that, uh, you know, give it a year or two and things will just revert to the way they were. That's, that's the nature of life. There are other people who see this pandemic uh, and uh, what's happening across the world right now as being absolutely transformational that will have um, uh, a complete revolutionary effect on society and politics on um, the way that we live and that transcends into uh, all walks of life. I think I fall into the camp of uh, and when we're talking about museums and galleries I would fall into the camp of that I think what we're, we will see is an acceleration of trends that were perhaps already underway, but which uh, have really uh, come to the fore. So um, uh, you touched on digital, and uh, I think that has been a tipping point, certainly in the museum sector. We've, uh, we've been working uh, online, we've been working with audiences uh, in, in, in different ways, digitally and so on and so forth. But the, um, the experience of uh, the last nine months has really highlighted how much you can do how much you can do with learning programs, how much you can do with outreach, how much you can do. Just to give you one example, um, uh, our membership organization, uh, we have what, uh, around 14,000 uh, members. And of course you run programs for these good folk, you run lectures, you run um, uh, all sorts of activities on site. But of course, uh, and it sounds, perhaps a little bit naive, but the realization that it's so much easier to reach those people digitally rather than to service maybe 60 at a time with one lecture. You can now reach, you know, we, for the, we've been putting um, uh, talks a little bit like this online for our friends and also for our American friends. And uh, the response has been great and you can reach so much more people. Okay, uh, maybe a very easy example, but uh, that that is transformational. And then the other two, aspects I think I'd probably mention is um, that uh, uh, there is a, obviously a dramatic change in the audiences that, uh, that we're now dealing with. We're used to uh, a mix of international and um, national local, which would be about at least 50% of our audience would be um, international. Now that's gone. 
and the question is how long that takes to come back but it does mean that you now focus perhaps more closely on a local audience and on your reach within Scotland and that's possibly a really good thing and the other big change is um, income um, we've worked very hard to create new streams of uh, income to uh, help uh, supplement what we uh, receive in support from uh, government as government subsidy and a lot of that has fallen away uh, so you know I mentioned cafes and shops which have closed uh, so uh, there's a <laughs> it's going to have a big impact on um, uh, the, the COVID is going to have a big impact on all public finances all private finances as well but I think uh, it will um, we'll we'll be seeing the impact of that for many many years uh, right across the public sector and that that comes into play with us as well. So you already mentioned there a couple of kind of positive changes that have emerged since the pandemic such as being able to reach more people um, do you think that the positive changes have kind of outweighed the negative have you been able to notice more interest in the galleries or see people are spending more time at home are they getting more interested in watching online lectures or engaging with the museum yeah well you you, you put it very well i mean I, I wouldn't like to put a, this into the balance and say that positive outweighs the negative because uh you know for so many people this has been such a terrible year and when you go, we're, we're, we're really happy to be open again with, with these sites, but the experience is, is really quite different. You know, having to, to book online uh, in advance and uh, turn up at a specific time to have an hour to visit, to go around um, uh, with um, uh, such small numbers. We're operating at about 20% of the, the, the numbers that we would usually have. Uh, to, to be able to keep to social distancing and a two meter, we have to keep to a two meter uh, distance, uh, even also for all the pinch points like entries, entrances and so on and so forth. So it's very closely regulated. So the experience is, uh, is quite different. Some people like that, they think it's a bit more, um, I don't know, intimate. But uh, I personally feel that visiting a gallery is, is also a social experience and you kind of miss that, uh, that, that effect that you're, that you're sharing an experience with other people. Um, the positives, uh, uh, I would say that uh, uh, the reaction that we've had from the returning public has been amazing. Um, and it makes you, it reminds you that, uh, that having museums and galleries and cultural uh, uh, facilities and attractions isn't just a frivolous thing, it's a real need that people really respond to that. And it's been important, I think, for people's well-being, for their health, for their mental health, for their ability to connect, if you like, that, uh, that, that, that they're able to, they might not be able to go to pubs or restaurants at the moment, but here is something that they can do. Uh, and I think that's been really important. And perhaps one other positive effect has been uh, both internally and externally, I sense greater collaboration a sense of uh, people working together better and that uh, you know that's part of a crisis isn't it that you end up with uh, okay uh, let's concentrate on the important things so internally that's been a feature and I think externally as well so that the cultural sector in Scotland is pretty fragmented uh, and the museum sector is uh, quite diverse You've got a few big players and then you've got uh, lots, a few medium sized players and then you've got lots and lots of uh, small museums across the country. But there is a sense uh, coming through that uh, people are more in touch with one another. They're sharing information, they're sharing experiences, learning uh, better. And I think that's a that's a positive effect. And I hope we can build on that in um, in the years to come. So do you think that with the move to more um, people accessing exhibitions remotely will change the way institutions use their collections in terms of having items in storage before you could only have so much on display? But do you think now more art will be able to be seen by the public? Yeah, that's a that's a very good question. I, mean, I think it's, a, again, a trend that's accelerated. Uh, I mean, we we don't think of our uh, collection as being like an iceberg that there's part of it visible and then there's the rest which is kind of invisible uh, our model is we think of the entire collection of being in use and being of use 
So uh, uh, some of that might be for research, some of it might be for constantly refreshing displays. Um, uh, and so on, uh, but the um, you know the the whole process of digitization, and uh, we have a fairly large proportion now of the the collection is is digitized. I think we're at something like eighty percent. Um, so that was underway, uh, but the the experience of um, uh, of, uh, of of lockdown and uh, all of this has meant that. Uh, yeah, you you get a greater sense of how you can use that and exploit it in the in the future in so many different ways. I think uh, also related to your question is um, uh, uh, across my career, I can't remember, remember how many times people have said, "Oh, the time of the great big blockbuster exhibitions is over." And I've been hearing that for thirty years, um, but of course, blockbuster bit exhibitions continue. But it's it's pretty obvious that it's going to be harder as we go forward to uh, for um, uh, works of art to travel, uh, to uh, to share those uh, exhibitions internationally at least in the short term. So I think one of the side effects will be that uh, museums like ours will be looking back into the permanent collection to see, well, instead of borrowing or, or creating an exhibition with Paris or London or New York, what can we do from our from our own resources? Uh, looking at that, interpreting it in, a, in fresh ways and new ways. Uh, so that too could be a positive thing. Linking also into uh, the, the, the increased uh, awareness of environmental issues, which again has accelerated in the, in the, in the last while. We're, we're very conscious that in, in our business, um, uh, we're not necessarily the good guys in the environmental world. We're encouraging people to uh, visit. We're encouraging people to, to travel. Uh, we're transporting works of art uh, around the place. So again, thinking again about different models, which will be more environmentally friendly, could be an important side effect of all this. So yeah, lots to digest as we go forward. In terms of other recent news, obviously have the recent protests that have been happening throughout the pandemic, including the racial justice movement. Has this led the National Galleries to look at your collections in a different light or to maybe rethink the presenting of exhibitions? Yeah, it has. No, great question. And um, there are moments, I think, in, uh, in history where uh, which you just might describe as a tipping point, and uh, it's it's obvious that the the, the murder of George Floyd was a, an absolute uh, tipping point, and um, what it has um, uh, unleashed across the the the, the world, uh, particularly in America and in uh, in Europe, uh, is uh, extraordinary, um, and uh, I think it has. Uh, heightened an awareness in, uh, in all of us, I hope as individuals, but certainly as organizations that uh, we've got so much more to do to uh, play our part in combating racism. And so, yes, it's, uh, it's provoked with us um, uh, a whole refresh of our approach to equalities. Uh, we've established uh, different ways of um, uh, approaching this uh, internally and how we then uh, involve people externally. So we've been uh, doing a lot of work on that. And one of the strands of that is um, uh, how we look again at uh, the, the collection and to use the fashionable term, how we decolonize it. Um, yeah, if you're sitting in a place like uh, Edinburgh or Glasgow, or even St Andrews, uh, the colonial history is there in the in the very fabric of the of the of the towns and the cities. Um, but it's also within our collections in uh, the people that are represented and how they're uh, presented. It's in uh, uh, how works of art arrived in uh, in the collection. So uh, one of the things that we've been doing, and just one of the threads, is uh, we've uh, identified um, uh, all of the uh, the works that uh, are on show that um, uh, where they should be, the presentation of them should be rethought, and the labelling of it rethought. Uh, curators think a lot about labels, 
Um, and uh, I was just looking at some examples yesterday of reinterpretation where uh, instead of presenting so-and-so in, in a rather heroic light, you bring more to the fore that uh, this person's wealth came through exploitation, through uh, slave plantations in Jamaica or whatever it is. And we uh, consciously go through uh, and do that. But of course, that's just one thread. It's much, much wider than that. It embraces uh, looking at uh, the acquisitions that you make, how diverse and representative are they. Um, uh, it's um, uh, looking at the organization itself and uh, how diverse uh, and uh, representative are you as an organization. So, yes, I would say it's a, it's a, 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 it's a major um, uh, turning point in how we look at so many things. And then lastly, I'll, uh, on this, I suppose, is that uh, a, a lot of attention concentrates on uh, Black Lives Matter, and that's deeply important. But of course, equality is so much broader than that. Uh, it's uh, broader also than the nine protected characteristics. And in Scotland in particular, one thinks of uh, social inequality. So you know, particularly having gone through the, uh, the experience of the pandemic, we have, I think, uh, uh, an obligation to think about our role within the whole terms of uh, within Scotland and uh, addressing issues of equality, uh, uh, social inequality across the country, which we know are very marked and which I think have become even more marked perhaps through the experience of the last nine months. So it's a long answer to your question. No, that was very interesting. Thank you. Um, so in terms of looking forward to the future, what are you most looking forward to for the galleries in 2021? Oh, in 2021. All right. Well, as a, as, a, as, a, as a slightly glib answer, I think I'd say one of the things I'm looking forward to is the 1st of January 2021. <laughs> so we could say goodbye to 2020. It's been such a shitty year. Pardon my language. I mean, it really has. So uh, the 1st of January <laughs> is a real, really attractive prospect. I, I suppose more seriously, I would... I, 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 the, the, Perhaps it's it's obvious, but I was talking earlier about uh, the experience uh, of visiting an art gallery at the moment, and what I would really look forward to is uh, 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 an experience which uh, uh, that our public can have an experience which is perhaps more social, that uh, allows more people in, that allows uh, you also to um, enjoy the fringe benefits of um, going to the shop and going to the cafe and just making it a sort of a, a whole experience again instead of a sort of an expedition planned in advance um, and uh, one of the great things about our, our uh, national collections is that they are free and that you could fall into them as it were um, and uh, to be able to go back to uh, sorry I shouldn't talk about going back but to be able to rekindle that that uh, social and perhaps more spontaneous uh, experience is something we hold out i think we all hold out a hope for in uh, in 2021 so let's uh, let's keep our fingers crossed for that definitely um and my final question would be uh what would your advice be for students who are watching this who may be interested in pursuing a career in the field of museums and galleries yeah, that's a great question well, uh, well, don't necessarily f uh, follow the, uh, certainly wouldn't look to, to my career as any kind of a model because I've kind of fallen into things through luck, I think, uh, uh, mainly. Uh, as, as, I suppose a, a serious piece of advice would be to um, follow closely the way that the uh, needs of organisations are changing and, and developing. Um, when I became a uh, whatever it was, assistant keeper or, or, or curator. It was a kind of an old fashioned world where um, a museum curator was somebody who uh, looked after the, uh, the, the, the collection and did research um, uh, and uh, had a very kind of um, almost a, 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 a narrow uh, role. Um, and uh, if fast forward, to, fast forward to today then, Museums, galleries are very, very different kinds of uh, organizations and institutions. So they are, uh, yes, there are still the traditional elements of collection care, 
conservation, curatorial and uh, research that you would expect. But we're also visitor attractions, so uh, we need skills in marketing, we need skills in um, uh, audience and psychology and, uh, uh, and how, you, uh, how you engage with visitors. You touched on uh, digital and um, so skills in uh, digital, in creating uh, uh, videos, for example. Um, uh, we, we've just been advertising for a videographer. Um, so the, the, the needs are, uh, are shifting as the uh, profession, as the sector changes. And uh, so the ability to combine uh, depth and the depth of uh, knowledge that um, that you and your uh, colleagues are uh, acquiring, with awareness and breadth and skills across different areas, um, particularly in the in the digital area, just is is I think going to be ever more crucial. And the only other thing I would add to that is um, at the risk of sounding like an old fuddy duddy is you know follow your interests. Uh, there's lots of competent people uh, out there there's lots of really um, uh, good people uh, technically but you know in a business like this which is uh, about art about people uh, enthusiasm passion motivation and the ability to convey that and share it with other people and engage other people that's the magic ingredient that we're always looking for so um, if you can if you can find ways to instill that uh, alongside your uh, academic work, then um, then you're you're well on the way. Thank you so much for joining us today, and thank you for your answers. They've been very informative, and I'm sure everyone who watches will really enjoy hearing about this. So thank you for being with us. You're very welcome, and and, and thank you for uh, for asking, and and good luck to you all. I I just. I'm aware that it has not been in any way easy for uh, for students and students' life at uh, the moment. It, it, uh, it must be really strange, but I wish you the very best of luck and uh, uh, I hope it all goes well for you. Thank you.